I'd like to thank Carrie Beth, as usual, for leading us in a wonderful children's sermon. It's often better than the actual sermon. Certainly that is the case today. Uh, perhaps just a little more dynamic than her normal children's sermons, but it really was really quite wonderful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That sounds like a hug to me. I had walked out of the office door of Calvary Church and I was less than 15 feet from my car when I heard her voice. Mister, do you work here? Mister, can you help me? I turned and I, I looked into the face of, of need, into the face of worry, the, the face of little hope, a face that was tired and beat down and dirty. Yes, ma'am, I do. Well, I'm in a heck of a mess. I cleaned that up just a little. And I need someone to help me. Mister, can you help me? I need gas money to get me and my daughter to Columbia today. Can you help me? Well, ma'am, are we talking Columbia in Adair County or, or Columbia in South America? And she smiled and she said, you know what I mean. She told me that her daughter had a, had a court date for a parole hearing in Columbia at 9 o'clock the next morning. She showed me the court documents. And if they left soon, they could make it to Columbia before dark. And I asked, do you have a place to spend the night in Columbia? Many family or, or friends there? No, but we'll sleep in the van. There's plenty of room. Please, please help me, mister. If they revoke her parole, she'll lose her kids. Beginning to look at her perhaps more as a person than a problem, I asked, well, how many children does your daughter have? Three. Two girls and a boy. Is there a dad in the picture? No, he, he ran off with my other daughter. And they're in Ohio somewhere. Mister, can you help me? Well, ma'am, we don't give money to folks, but if you, if you meet me over at the Speedway station on Broadway, I'll fill up your tank with gas. Would that help? Mister, that's just what I need. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll leave now and I'll, I'll, I'll meet you over there. Just pull up to the pump. What kind of car do you have? It's a blue Chevy van. I pulled into the Speedway and they were already there in their blue 1988 Chevrolet Astro van. It looked just like one that Ken and Susan Agent had back in the day for all I know, Ken, it may have been that very van, but now with sort of faded paint and lots of rust, and I paid for the gas, and then I went out to pump it for her, and that's where our conversation continued. Our kids' problems, they never stop, do they, mister? Well, no, I guess not. Mister, do you have kids? Yes, I, yes, I do. I have I have two daughters, just like you. I feared what was coming next. Do they, do they have kids? Yes, they do. Do they have husbands? Yes, they do. Do they have jobs? Yes, they do. What jobs? Well, the, the older girl is an attorney and the younger is a, is a nurse practitioner. Mister, do you know how lucky you are. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. The Astro van took every bit of $40 worth of gas, and then we were done. And I turned to say goodbye to this rather portly lady in an old green smelly wool top coat with breath that would stop a train. And she said, come here, mister. You're going to get a hug. <laughs> I protested that a, that a hug would not be necessary. I, I really didn't deserve one. I hadn't done anything to earn one. But it was too late. 
and I was the victim of a hug attack. So there we were standing next to pump number six at the Speedway on Broadway, sharing a hug. And if you happen to be riding by that day and saw me hugging a lady who is not my current wife, <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> when, the, when the encounter with the lady began, I thought that I was 15 feet away from escaping a problem. But it turned out that I was 15 feet away from missing a direct blessing from God in the form of a hug. You know, the Bible doesn't say a great deal about hugging per se. Luke 15, 20 reminds us that the prodigal sons are worth a hug, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. When the Apostle Paul was saying goodbye, the last goodbye, to his friends at Ephesus, we read in Acts 20, 37, and there was much weeping on the part of all, and they embraced Paul and they kissed him. But that's pretty much it for mention of embracing or hugging in the New Testament. Could this mean that the Lord God and the Lord God's Son are not huggers? Loy Geyer is one of Calvary's most accomplished huggers. Every time that I see her on the good days and on the challenging days, Loy gives me, and gives many of you, a hug. She already gave me a hug this morning. But me, not so much. I'm a bit of an introvert, I'm a, I'm a tad shy, and I parcel my hugs out, well, really rather sparingly. Perhaps that's why I remember the hug with the Astro Van Lady so well. The good news this morning is that God is not just a hugger, that God is the consummate hugger. We speak of grace as God's unmerited favor. We sang of grace just now as God's unmerited favor. Grace is God's unmerited hug. There is nothing that we can do to merit God's hug. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. It comes to us simply because God loves us unconditionally, just as we are. It's John 3:16 love, and it is the ultimate hug. In writing to the Roman church, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8, and that too is a hug. When was the last time that you were on the receiving end of a godly hug? And when was the last time the Lord God used you to hug someone else? Mark 2, 1 through 12, which Nikki just read, our primary text for the morning, is all about hugs. This was my, I think, my very favorite Bible story as a child. I still remember it as the most dramatic of all the miracle stories in Mark's gospel. Jesus has returned secretly to his Capernaum home base. Very likely he is at Simon Peter's house. But soon his presence is discovered and he's again confronted by a huge crowd. And while he is speaking the word to them, that's proclaiming the good news of God's dawning kingdom in him, he's, he's suddenly interrupted. And it's not a lady who needs to get to Columbia. The roof above him is being demolished. Four men unable to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus through the crowd have lifted him up onto the flat roof. And after digging through the mud and the branches covering the beams, they, they lower their friend with ropes on a mat into Jesus' presence. No word is spoken by the men. They have no lines. None of them say, Mr., can you help us? But their, their daring action renders their faith visible. And in every way, their actions are a hug because they are willing to take extraordinary measures to help a friend. And this is far, far more risky than filling up the tank of an astro man. You know, I guess at one level, their faith may be no more than confidence that, 
this Jesus is an effective healer. But I'm guessing that Mark has something more in mind. These men, they actually dare to believe that God's victory over evil, including the evil of physical disability, is being actualized in the ministry of Jesus. And praise God, they got that one right. And one wonders today if we believe that as well. Do we understand that God's victory over evil is happening in the ministry of Jesus? And who is living out Christ-like ministry in the world today? Well, that would be us. That would be you and that would be me. How we doing? Does evil seem to be on the run? Look around the room this morning. We've got more than our share of people in this room who were educated at Georgetown College and lesser institutions. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're smart, right? We're courageous. But like these four friends, do we employ boldness? Do we employ ingenuity to bring people to Jesus? And if not, why not? Well, Mark doesn't really tell us whether or not the paralyzed fellow shares his friend's faith. Jesus' reaction suggests the possibility that he doesn't. But if instead of responding to a mute cry for healing, Jesus declares, child, your sins are forgiven. And since a declaration like that only occurs here in this gospel, we should assume that this is a very big deal. And with his head, the man believes that it belongs to God's nature to forgive. But he just can't quite believe in his heart that God wills to forgive him. And Jesus has preached repentance, repentance but authentic, life-changing repentance requires that faith thing, a personal faith thing, and the good news that's been proclaimed to all must now be addressed to one needy individual in a form that he can understand and he can appropriate. And of course, it's always personal. And Jesus does just that. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus forgives sin. You know, that's really good news because no matter how much I worry about the sins of of people like you, it's my sin that's killing me, and I need a Savior. The man's, his disability is, is powerfully symbolic, and many, many sermons have been preached on that theme. Guilt is a crippler. It can hinder our worship of God. It handicaps our relationships with family and with friends. Indeed, there are documented cases in which paralysis has been caused by my feelings of guilt, but I don't think that's where Mark is going. The man's paralysis is not cured by Jesus' words of absolution. And so for the first word to become fully effective, perhaps he needs Jesus' second words, which is, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and head to the house. The cure of his paralysis finally convinces him that God really has forgiven him. Well, my goodness, what do you think this, might, this man might have said to Jesus? What do you think he might have said to his friends when they got back to the house? My guess is that it was hugs all around. But now the story takes a bit of an ugly turn. I mean, who could find fault in this act of love, in this hug? Surely no one. But in this passage, we encounter for the first time a negative response to Jesus. Up to this point, Mark has presented Jesus' ministry as just an overwhelming success, bordering on perfection. But that is about to change. Two weeks ago, Bob Browning spoke to the disappointing response of the synagogue leaders to Luke's Jesus. And then last Sunday, Justin Sizemore spoke to a, to a similar sad encounter Jesus had with religious leaders in another section of Luke's gospel. But today, in Mark's gospel this time, it happens again. 
At his first appearance in Capernaum, Jesus was received enthusiastically as one who taught with authority and not as the scribes. And now some of those scribes appear in the audience and they silently accuse Jesus of vile heresy. He has committed blasphemy in their eyes by claiming the divine prerogative of forgiving sins. That made him a blasphemer subject to being stoned to death according to Levitical teachings. And the scribes' unspoken question, who could forgive sins except the one God, is reminiscent of the Shema, Israel's basic creed, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So in other words, what's going on here? Is this fellow trying to subvert monotheism, claiming to be God by forgiving sins? Just who does this Jesus think he is? You know, sometimes I really do think that I would, be a, I would be a good scribe. I mean, really, who would boo a hug? Who would witness a miraculous he healing brought about by the amazing love, the amazing hug of amazing friends who use their guile and their wits to bring a hurting man to Jesus and focus not on the miracle, but on the credentials of the miracle worker. And as Paul Duke once said, who would sacrifice a miracle on the altar of legalism? It's the anti-hug crowd. It's the scribes, the most religious leaders of the day. On our worst days, it's us. And it might serve us well to remember that the scribes were on the receiving end of Jesus' woes, as in woe unto you. And by their stubbornness, and by their sin, they missed a hug from the Lord of love. When was the last time Jesus gave you a hug? When was the last time that Jesus used you to hug someone else? Can you remember how did it feel? How did it feel? We close today with this. The picture you see on the screens is a rather idyllic photo of our three Cincinnati-based grandchildren on a day of first, walking to the bus a month ago on the first day of school. For our firstborn grandchild, Caroline, it was her first day as a third grader. For five-year-old middle grandchild, Avery, it was her very first day of kindergarten, her first day on the school bus. For two-year-old Tucker, who would start a preschool program a few weeks later, it was to be nothing more than a walk to the bus with his sisters. Now, Tucker is a very, well, precocious is a word, uh, little boy who, to everyone's great consternation, looks and acts a bit like his, his Lexington granddad. <laughs> and when he is puzzled or slightly upset, he gets a, he gets a little wrinkle in his brow. I'm not sure where, but I've, I've seen that wrinkled brow before. But moments after this picture, the girls boarded the bus and Tucker attempted to get on as well. If his big sisters were going to school, he was going too. My daughter had to remove him, had to pull him off the bus, okay? And then to prove that he is very much like his Lexington granddad, Tucker laid down on the sidewalk and through a wild, leg-kicking, arm-waving, yelling and screaming, two-year-old tantrum. I don't think it was demon possession, but I'm told it looked a great deal like it. My daughter did what moms do. She reached down, she picked Tucker up, and she gave him not what he deserved, but exactly what he needed. Sarah gave Tucker a hug. I had a, a wonderful hug Monday morning of this week. I had the opportunity to visit with a wonderful couple that have been friends of mine for so many years and been wonderful members of Calvary for all their adult lives. They were at a point in their lives where some things are changing. There are some serious issues that they are having to deal with and I thought I would drop by and see them and, and, and visit 
and maybe try to cheer them up just a little bit. What ensued over the next hour was one of the best hours I think that I've ever spent. We started talking about Calvary. We started telling Calvary stories. We started laughing. We just had so much fun. Then we shared Georgetown College stories. We were at Georgetown just a few years apart, but we had some of the same coaches and things, and we just told Georgetown stories that were just amazing, beyond belief, probably actually beyond belief, and, and we just had such a wonderful time. It was such a great experience, and we laughed, and, and we, we talked about Calvary, and I was reminded of all that is good and kind and wonderful about this congregation. And then as I was walking, we had prayer, and as I was walking down the sidewalk, walking away, I realized that I had been on the receiving end of a hug. And you know, if you talk to this wonderful couple, I think they would tell you they had a hug as well. You see, that's what Jesus does. When our, when our problems overwhelm us, when, when our plans go awry, when it looks like we're in a pickle and, and nobody cares, Jesus arranges or a hug. It could be four loving friends. It could be God's love poured out on the cross. You could be the hugger. You could be the huggy. It doesn't matter because we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. It's not something that we can buy. But a hug is what we need. And Jesus always, always comes through to pick us up off the sidewalk and give us hug. Mister, can you help me? Be careful how you respond. Your answer could lead you right smack into the middle of a hug. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, you will remember that my grandmother Blankenship, Mom B, used to say that a hug delights and warms and charms. Perhaps that's why you gave us arms. Lord, help us this day and help us every day to feel your arms around us and to be your arms as we give people hugs in your name. Lord, this we pray in the name of the Lord of love, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.